world. <laughs> they plug into different things of the world that really it doesn't help whatsoever. We need to get it plugged into the right source. The right source is the Word of God and Jesus Christ. So the thing we got to ask, what are you plugged into? People here, this is a Sunday night time, and these are basically the cream of the crop. But we need to understand, we need to be plugged into the Word of God. Here in our passage, we see that the new Christians found a source to get plugged into <clears throat> that changed not only their lives, but this source turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Notice verse 31. The Bible says, and when they had prayed, notice that, what did they do? They prayed. The place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. soul. Neither said any of them that uh, ought, I'm sorry, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Hey, grace is a great thing for us to have. Grace comes when you're following the Lord, and God gives us that measure that we need to keep on going, to keep on following, to keep serving, to keep the faith and everything else. We need grace, and great grace was upon them. They, these folks had already been suffering. They healed a man. They were pulled into question uh, for healing, uh, healing the man, and they were threatened not to preach and teach in that name, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what did they do? They asked God for the boldness to keep preaching. They prayed. So this evening, I want to give us three things that you and I need to be plugged into, to be plugged into. All the power that you and I need is available Keep your finger here. Go with me to a couple other passages. Go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. All the power that we need is available to us. We have the promise of the power of the Great Commission here in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. I told you earlier today that I've had a pastor tell me that door to door doesn't work anymore. I'm sorry, but it does. You see, I've got a passage here that God tells us to keep doing this. Here in Matthew 28, 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. That word therefore means because of what he said. Because all power is given unto him, therefore we ought to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. We're to go. The power for you and I to go is is there. Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth is mine. Because it's mine, go. Go and tell. Go and preach. Go and witness. Go and knock. Go and seek. Go and find. And tell people about the Lord. I think of the power that Paul longed for of the resurrection in Philippians 3.10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Then he says something unusual and the fellowship of his suffering Made, being made conformable unto his death. For instance, <clears throat> suffering. We don't want to suffer. But he suffered and he says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. What are some of the sufferings that he's talking about? Well, people cast down their eyes on Jesus. People said some terrible things about Jesus. They called him a blasphemer. They said he casted out devils in the name of the devil. He doesn't do that. Satan, a house divided against itself, cannot stand. And so they said some terrible things about him. Oh, he's breaking the law. He's, he's healing on the Sabbath day. You know, he's not right. How can he be of God? People ever say anything bad about you because you're a Christian? Because you don't dress like they dress? Because you don't act like they act? Because you don't drink like they drink? And you don't go to the places that they go? Of course, that's because you're a Christian. They cast down their eyes. We got a world today that we're living in, and uh, uh, you say something against homosexuality or sodomy, and people are going to get mad and get angry at you. Why? Because you're different. You've got it together. You're a saved person. You're a Christian. Well, I'm reserving a place in hell for you. No, can't do it. I'm saved. No matter what you say, no matter what you think, I'm going to heaven. 
And you can't change that, and I can't change that, because I've received Jesus Christ as my Savior. His blood has already washed away my sins, and I can't go to hell. I cannot go to hell, because I'm heaven-bound. I've been birthed into the family of God through the uh, spiritual birth of Jesus Christ. Amen for that. In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, the early church had the power to change the world. Here in Acts 17, 6, it says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. They were recognized for changing things. They were movers and shakers. Who were these men? These are the apostles. These are the disciples of Jesus Christ. They were credited for changing things. They were credited for uh, changing the world and turning things upside down. How can a man do that? Because the power is in the Word of God. You see, me as a Christian and you as a Christian, I'm sealed with His Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells me and you, greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. And when we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and when the few words that come out of our mouth because the Holy Spirit is telling us to speak, they hold a lot of weight. And the world in all their elegance and all their wisdom, they cannot hold a candle to the power of the few words that the Holy Spirit has told you to speak. There's power in that. There's weight in that. And these men are just obeying Jesus Christ by going here and sharing the Word of God. And the rulers could not stop it. They couldn't stop it from happening. They were upset because people were turning to Jesus Christ and their lives were changing and they were getting frustrated and they were getting angry because they wanted to stop this from happening and they couldn't do it. Well, let me ask you something. How can this power be yours? How can it be mine? Let me give you the first one. Go back to Acts chapter 4, verse 31. First, you've got to be plugged into the power of prayer. You have to be plugged into the power of prayer. Friday night, we had a bunch of guys in that room. Amen, Michael? Boy, it was awesome to see all those guys in that room Friday night praying together. We got in a big circle. You know what? Some of the prayers that the guys spake, they were just two or three sentences. But that's okay. It was just sweet time together, a sweet fellowship. We were praying together talking to the Lord, making a request. Here, verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake with the Word of God with boldness. You see, they were threatened. Don't you dare go out there and preach in that name. Don't you teach in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't do it. I'm telling you, you can't do it. When they left, were they scared? Yes, they were scared. They're men just like we are, flesh and blood, but they're saved. Those are my brothers. Those are your brothers in Jesus Christ. The same fear that they experience, you and I experience today. And so what did they do? They got on their knees and said, Lord, you heard their threatenings. You heard what they said. Lord, I'm asking you this one thing. Give me the boldness to preach in your name. Give me the boldness to keep on keeping on. They didn't ask God to to stop them from threatening them. They said, God, give me the boldness to keep going. And God did. God was so impressed. And remember, too, this is God's early church. The church, the New Testament church was just birthed. And God's protecting his baby. It says the the place was shaken. Do you believe that? I do. I do. This is a... This is a marking point in history, in time, in God's time, where God's, He says, I am so proud of you, and the place shakes. The Holy Spirit just thunders out. The assembly, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, they were filled with the Holy Spirit? I've heard preachers say stupid things. Once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're always filled with the Holy Spirit. No, once I'm saved, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. You constantly need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you're filled with the Holy Spirit for service. You're filled with the Holy Spirit to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You can be filled with other things. You can be filled with bitterness. You're still sealed. You're still going to heaven. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're still going to heaven. You can't lose it. 
But you can be filled with trouble. You can be filled with busyness. You can be filled with your own things and your own personal life. He's saying they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because give us the boldness to keep speaking and preaching in your name. And God just filled them with their spirit. So that they went out and spake the word of God with boldness. Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever have, had that, that filling of the Holy Spirit when, when you just put your foot down and you said, I'm going to witness to somebody? I remember a time, and I've shared this before, but I remember uh, when I lived in Alabama and I was serious about winning souls for Jesus Christ, I fasted every Monday for nine months. It was after six months of doing that that I led my first soul to the Lord. That next three months, I was, it was like dominoes where God just led me to a person, to person, to person, to person, and seeing them saved left and right. God used me in a powerful way. I learned something. I was serious about reaching people for Jesus Christ. I remember one day, I, I, I went to school at night. Uh, I went to college at night, Bible college at night, and, and I was working on my degrees and trying to uh, prepare myself for the ministry. I'm living in an apartment complex, and I'm driving... Uh, my truck back from school, and I'm pulling in my parking lot, and there's four or five guys. They're standing in my parking lot spot, daring me, daring me to pull in there. You know what I did? I stepped on the gas. They moved real fast. <laughs> I got out, and I put my books on my, my hood of my truck, and I started pulling out, and they're bolstering up, and I start pulling out tracks. I started, hey, my name is Terry Boyd. I go to Madison Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to church. I had a boldness about me, and I was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And says, let me ask you men something. Do you know what those guys did? In Alabama, five black guys, all right, daring me. Even though I almost ran them over, I had them all five on their knees praying and accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior because of the boldness being filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He gives you the boldness to witness. You know what happens to people when you witness to them? Something inside of them submits to the Spirit that's in you. Really. If you're filled with the Spirit of God, something inside of them submits to the Spirit that's in you. Because greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. They might have this, a demon spirit in them. They might have a spirit of anger and evil and murder in them. But that same spirit in them will submit to the spirit in you if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. We've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You want it, you can have it. All you've got to do is ask for it and pray. So this place was shaken. They were filled with the spirit and the, the word of God was spoken with boldness. Oh, the message is clear, my friends. Power comes through prayer. Power comes through prayer. The disciples asked the Lord in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, to teach them to pray. And it says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto the Lord, Teach us to pray, as John also taught the disciples. We need to learn how to pray. You know what? It's okay. It's okay if you don't know how to pray. I delight in seeing a new person, a new Christian to pray. They may not understand what to say or how to say it but you know what we've been meeting for a long time on friday nights now i've watched those men in that group they come week after week after week sometimes they miss here and there but they keep coming back i've watched them mature in their prayers ron cody can pray mike mcclure can pray i love listening to those guys and you know at the beginning they were afraid to they stuttered and everything else but those men can pray I love it. I love praying with the men of the church here. And when they pray, when we pray together, we're touching heaven. We're touching heaven. And my friends, he says, teach us to pray. We need to ask God, Lord, teach me to pray. Show me how to talk to you. We're not trying to use flowery words. We're being real. We're praying from the heart. God, I want what you want. The things that I'm asking for are the things that you already want for me. The things that I'm asking for are the things that you already want for this church. The things we're asking for are the things you already want for your people. Teach us to pray. And he did. Let me give you another one. So we need to pray for 
We, we need to get plugged into the power of prayer. We need to get plugged into the power of love. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said of any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. You see, we understand what took place in chapters 1, 2, and 3. When people came to Jesus Christ, the Jews, uh, boy, they were just tough on them and everything and cast people out of their homes. Marriages were divided. Children lost their, their homes. People lost their jobs and, and everything just because they turned to Jesus Christ. Barnabas and the other one, they got together and they just started sharing. They just started sharing, giving of, you know, sold a piece of land. When Ananias and Sapphira did it, God got angry. You know why? Because they did it for the wrong reason. They wanted the praise of man, and God says, you know what? You're not going to get praise. All the glory goes to God. And God's saying, this church is my baby. It's mine, and you're not going to steal the thunder. You're not going to steal the glory. See, the, I don't get the glory. You don't get the glory. It all goes to God. We're working together because we're doing His work and His will. And God wants all of that. He says, oh, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any odd of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things. See, there was a love there. And we need to c continue to build that Christian love, building one another up. And you know what? We're all different, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, Terry, I'm sorry. I'm going to do it. <laughs> the ladies went to the meeting yesterday. And they couldn't hear what was being said about what kind of muffins were they? Okay. <laughs> and nobody could hear because everyone was, was talking until Terry opened her mouth. <laughs> he said there are gluten-free muffins here in the morning. <laughs> everybody heard her. I was told it got real quiet. Is that right? It got real quiet. I work in a public school. And they just started laughing. <laughs> Where was I going with that? <laughs> Never a dull moment. We got some awesome people, you know what? Loving one another, appreciating one another. We're all different, but it takes all kinds to make it go. Isn't that right? And we need one another. We need one another. Build that love. Foster that love. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of that's languages of men and of angels, and have not charity. I become as a sounding brass and a tinkling symbol. symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. You've got to have that charity. Now, you say, what's charity? What's the difference? And people say it's love. Folks, it's better than love. It's love coupled with grace. What that means, if I were to ask you, what does grace mean? People say it's unmerited favor. Favor that's not deserved. All right? So when you couple love with grace, then it's us extending love to those who do not deserve it. And he says, you can do all these great things of life. But if you don't have charity, it's worthless. You have to have a gracious love about you. And a person that has a gracious love about them, everybody loves them. Everybody respects them. Everybody wants to talk to that person. Everybody wants to know that person. Everybody says great things about it. And when somebody like that does something for you, it's humbling, isn't it? It's humbling. I mentioned this morning about um, uh, loving your enemies. Only Christians can do that. It's hard to love people who are talking bad about you. And Jesus tells us to love our enemies, and He tells us to do good to those who despitefully use you. He says when you do that, when you do good to those that despitefully use you, you're heaping coals of fire upon their head. So if somebody does something bad to you, they talk bad about you, and you don't retaliate, but you turn around and do something nice for them, boy, isn't that convicting? You're different. You're different. And the world does not know how to handle that. They don't. 
So we have to get plugged into the love of God. Love forgives. Love breaks down barriers. Love looks for the best in our brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. I remember talking to different people that have come from different problems, different backgrounds. I had one guy telling me all the sins of his past. Uh, this is somebody that's not even in here today, talking about the things that they were into. And you know what? I said, stop. What? I don't want to know this about you. I don't want to know all the dirty stuff that you've done in the past because I don't want to think that way of you. I want to think the best about you that I can possibly think. I want to give you the benefit of the doubt because you're my brother in Christ. And that's the way we ought to be. And sometimes we pull back from somebody. You know why? Because familiarity breeds contempt. And I don't want to have any contempt towards my brother and sister of Christ. I always want to think the best of them. I always want to give them the benefit of the doubt because that's what the love of Christ does. And when somebody disappoints you, you know what? You step back from the situation. You get your head together. And you try to handle it in a way that brings glory to God. That's the way we, we try to do things. Because it's all about getting plugged into the love of God. Love is considerate of others. Other people, especially those of the church. Our love for Christ... Um, it's our love for Christ that all other actions stem from. Let me ask you to keep your finger here. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 real quick. It's our love of, for Christ that all other actions stem from. In 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13, the Bible says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them that rose again. Do you understand what he's saying here? Your love controls your actions. If you love Christ, it's going to cause you to do things. If you really love Jesus Christ, then you're going to lay your life aside. You're going to lay your rights aside to please Him. He says a couple things here. He says, for whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. People say, well, I don't see anything wrong with drinking. Yeah, the Bible has a lot to say about alcohol, all right? It tells us not to be deceived by it. It says, hoard them wine and new wine take away the heart. And if for some reason you justify drinking alcohol, which I believe the Bible is totally against, then for your love of Christ, you should be willing to put it aside. You see, he says, or whether we be sober, it's for your cause. I've got a higher calling in life. I've got a higher purpose in life. And that higher calling in life and purpose in life is for the cause of Christ. And I want to have a positive impact on people's life. And I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to get drunk and do something stupid that's going to hinder my relationship with you and my relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know what? That also causes us to do other things. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. It's my love for Jesus Christ that compels me. It's my love for Jesus Christ that constrains me, that pushes me, that drives me, that causes me to do things that I normally wouldn't do if I didn't love Him. You know what I mean? If I didn't love Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be here. I'd still be painting and having a lot of money in the bank. But you know what? I wouldn't be as happy as I am now either. I wouldn't be as rich and when I say rich, I don't have, I'm not rich in money, but I'm rich in faith. I'm rich with my family because they love Jesus and we serve God together. But the love of Christ constrains us. It points us in a direction that normally we wouldn't go. It causes me to do things that I normally wouldn't do. It causes me to give when I don't feel that I have it to give. But I look at the needs and I say, God, I love you. I'll do it for you. 
because it's the love of Christ that constrains us. So we need to get plugged into that love, that love that shapes us and molds us. So we need to be plugged into the power of prayer, learning to pray, being a prayer warrior. We must get plugged into the power of love, and we must get plugged into the power of witnessing. In Acts chapter 4, verse 33, he says, and with great power, notice that, Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. You know, what does it mean to witness with great power? Oh, folks, I want to preach with great power. I want to witness to great power. What is it like to witness with great power? When you go knock on a door and you knock on that door and somebody gets saved, that's power. Because you've changed the direction of a soul from hell to heaven because something inside of them that does not want to listen to you they turn from that and they listen to you and the power of the holy spirit reaches deep into their heart and into their soul and says that's right there's great power in that i remember there's different times in my life when i felt weak physically but i was so strong spiritually my physical body was sick with malaria and sick with other things but the spirit of god was so mighty and strong on me i remember preaching a couple of different times when 108 people were saved and 110 people were saved i remember baptizing over 75 people at one time folks that was awesome that was awesome i love doing things like that we can all have that power the power to witness and people don't even know what it's like they've never tasted it Oh, I'm so glad of those folks that are going to be in that class and we'll have that class over and over and over again. I want to raise soul winners. I want this church to be a soul winning church. You say, preacher, uh, I don't have a job. Hey, you know what? You do have a job. It's called soul winning. We need people praying for our soul winners. We need people uh, uh, praying that more, more people will enter into this harvest and right out there is the fields. It's already out there. People need Jesus Christ. Went to the hospital yesterday. We pray for Tanya Alls. Her mom's dying. I don't know if she's still alive or not. But it's room 767. But there's a lot of people there that need Jesus Christ. A lot of people that need Jesus Christ. They're dying. The fields are ripe and ready to be harvested. But there's not enough laborers out there. You say, preacher, I don't know how to do it. Just open your mouth. Say, Lord, show me what to say. I'm going to open my mouth and start, and you finish, okay? You do that, he'll do it. I promise you. That's the boldness. The Holy Spirit can say things through you if you just open your mouth. Ch churches languish. They go backwards. They hurt because there's so few people, witnesses for Jesus Christ. So few people go out there without the power of God in their life. They're not filled with the Holy Spirit and they see no results. Oh, I do not like going out with somebody that's not filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've been out with somebody that's not filled with the Holy Spirit and you go and you knock on door, knock on door, knock on door, knock on door. One or two times happening, that's okay, that's one thing. But you keep going out with the same person. You never see somebody saved. Change, go with somebody else. You want to see people saved. Too many people go out there knocking on doors and never see any results. That's a person that's not filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to see people saved. We want to see people bow their heads and repent because there's a power that's in you that's not in the world. And when you see somebody submit in their, their home, you are in their home, and they submit to the power that's in you, and they bow their heads, and they pray. And accepting Christ, there's some power in that, folks. We need to plug into this thing called witnessing. You say, well, I can't witness at work. But there's some things that you can do. There's more than one way to witness. You witness in your actions. You witness in the hard times you go through. Do you realize that the world goes through the same storms that you go through? In Matthew chapter 7, it talks about the wise man and the foolish man. And each of them go through the storms of life. Both go through the storms of life. But the world looks at the Christian as they go through the, the same storms of life. How come you're still standing when I fell? Because there's a power in me. It's the power of Jesus Christ. There's a witness there. 
I've got Jesus who sustains me. He's my rock. He's my foundation. He's the one that keeps me afloat. Oh, I've seen Christians go through some horrible things. Go through some hard times, the loss of a loved one. Some, uh, some things that happen in their life when the world looks at them and says, I don't know how you're still going. People crumble and fail. There's a witness in that. You know, I think of Job when he lost all of his children. I don't know what it's like. I, I remember there's been times in my life where I've almost lost a child or two. I remember in Africa the times when Job was just a little baby. <laughs> he was cute back then. <laughs> but I remember the times when my wife and I stayed up all night with him because we thought we were going to lose him. And I remember that pain. I remember the worry. I remember the tears of almost losing a loved one. It's not easy. And some of you have lost loved ones. I only know the pain that we went through. I don't know the pain that you've gone through. But you know, it's Jesus Christ that sustains us. And Job lost all of his children. But you know, he knew he'd see him again in heaven. And he's there with him in heaven now. That's just temporary. It's not permanent. And someday, we'll see them again. And we praise God for that. We have that hope that the world doesn't have. See, the world doesn't have that. They don't understand. That's a way to witness. And see, there's all kinds of ways that we can witness. But we've got the word of God that we can share. Witnessing Christians are a powerful force in this world. And the more of us that get it together and start witnessing and learning how to witness and memorize John 3.16 and Romans 3.10 and Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8 and 9 and Romans 10.13 and uh, 9 and 10 and 13, you memorize those verses and you go out and start just giving verses and quoting the scripture and witnessing God's going to bless. And you, you've, I've even heard it from you. You may go witnessing in this area and God brings somebody into church from this area. What's happening? God's honoring you. God's honoring you. You've seen it. I've seen it. So we need to get plugged into the power. Get plugged into the power of prayer. Get plugged into the power of love. Get plugged into the power of witnessing. I think of the accomplishments of the early church. My friends, they didn't have the advantages we have today. They didn't have the technology that we have today. But they stressed just the basic things of just going out and telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are you plugged into? Where is your source of power? What are you plugged into? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus Christ's name, we need you. We need to be plugged into you. We need to be praying. We need to be loving. We need to be witnessing. And I'm asking in Jesus Christ's name, help us to keep that on our hearts and our minds all the time. Help us to understand what you have for us and that we have to continually be plugged into it all the time. We need you, Lord. Help us in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one's looking about.